Yo guys, what is up? Here we are with another reading video, and today we are on chapter 11 and 12 of Lost in the Pacific 1942. So, I have gotten two recommendations for books so far, and that those books will be the ones read, unless either I don't think that I'm going to get any views, which is possible, or someone outbids it. So, if you want a different book read, make sure to leave a comment and tell me what you want to be read. So, you have to read it yourself. Because that's the beauty of this. So, without any further ado, let's get right into it. Lost in the Pacific, 1942, by Todd Olson. Chapter 11. Letters to Snooks. Army planes en route to the southwest Pacific have been joined the search for Captain E.V., Eddie Rickenbacker. War Department officials disclosed today in the hope of finding that the missing World War I ace might still be found. That was the news from Washington, D.C. on November 1st, the 12th day since the war had last heard from the B-17 crew. Unlike many newspaper editors, the U.S. military had not given up on the lost men. Planes headed for the battle battlefront in the Solomon Islands were to break formation and fan out to look for a stray raft on the waves below. To the flyers peering out the windows of their warplanes, finding, finding Eddie Rickenbacker was probably not the foremost things, thing on their mind. They were headed back into some of the most brutal fighting of the war. Four of them had been trotted out to talk to reporters at Hickman Field just two days earlier. They'd been on Guadalcanal, the tiny jungle island that figured heavily in Rickenbacker's mission. Since October 12th, the Japanese had been trying desperately to win back the island's airstrip. It was the site of life and death struggle, reported the New York Times. The outcome could decide the war in the Pacific for good. According to what the Flyers told reporters, they had some things in common with the castaways on the rafts. They barely slept, thanks to the relentless bombing runs by the Japanese. By 11 p.m., every night they were up and running for their foxholes. The ground was shaking all the time like jelly, said one of the men. They were also hungry most of the time, because Japanese warships surrounding the island made it hard for Americans to land supplies. The men were stuck with two meals a day, mostly rice left behind by the Japanese. On October 24th, about the time Rickenbacker had been scheduled to arrive in the area, the Marines held off a massive attack by the Japanese on the outskirts of the airstrip. The fighting with a line of Japanese corpses stretching for half a mile along the edge of the jungle. It also left the Americans with fewer than 30 planes to fend off the bombings. Japanese ships were still massing in the waters around Guadalcanal. It was obvious they were preparing to land another wave of troops. The Marines needed planes fast from bases in Hawaii and the mainland United States, and that meant that more pilots were in the sky with orders to look for eight men that most Americans had already given up on. On the rafts, the men were almost never mentioned in the war. Rickenbacker was determined to get back and complete his mission, but he kept his thoughts to himself. The rest of the men had no idea what was happening in Guadalcanal, or the Soviet Union, or North Africa. Nor did they care. The newspapers and the generals and the politicians claimed they were fighting for freedom and democracy. But in the rafts, the men found it hard to get excited about noble causes when they had six ounces of water to drink in two weeks. DeAndros, for one, was bitter that he had to die of dehydration, all because some guys made up their minds to have a war. All of the eight raft mates, however, DeAndros was not the one closest to death. When the sun rose on the twelfth day at sea, everyone was relieved to see that Alex, Alex's condition had improved. He seemed to know where he was and who his raft mates were. As the day wore on, though, he sank into a familiar state. His forehead felt hot as the sun. When he tried to talk, he made no sense. Alex rallied as the cool air, as the air cooled, and that evening he asked to go back to the small raft. By this time, DeAndros traded. This time, DeAndros traded places with Alex. Bartek took his fellow engineer into the donut hole and tried to get comfortable, but Alex would not sit still. He squirmed and draped himself over the side of the rafts. Bartek quickly realized he was trying to end it all by giving himself up to the ocean. Bartek maneuvered Alex's egg legs under his and sat on them. When the wretched kid complained, Bartek let him squat on the floor of the raft. He spread his own legs out on the side walls of the, so Alex would have to climb over them to get out. At one point during the night, he had to grab Alex just before he slipped into the ocean.
In the darkness, Bartek could hear his raftmates mumbling to no one in particular. For several days, Alex had ha- hadn't spoken much. Now he sounded more coherent than the, he had the entire trip. He prayed that he would see his mother, his sister, and his girlfriend, Snooks, again. Somewhere around two or three in the morning, he mumbled what sounded like a familiar prayer. Holy Mother Mary, Mary Mother of God, pray for us. He ended with an Amen. And then he stopped moving. Bartek knew what had happened, but he willed himself to check. In the darkness, he found Alex's arm and checked and felt for a pulse. Nothing. He leaned forward and put his hand over Alex's heart. Nothing. Twenty feet away in the middle raft, Rickenbacker woke up. He thought he heard a long sigh. Maybe Bartek had called him and he had heard the words in half conscious in a half conscious state. Maybe he simply knew. Did he die? He called out across the waves. I think so, Bartek said. They pulled the raft close. Rickenbacker, Sherry, and Whitaker examined Alex as well as they could in the dark. There was no question he was dead. But it, but they agreed they should wait till first light to do anything. Well, someone said, his sufferings are over. They let the drafts drift apart. The wind had come up strong and the sea turned around them. Rickenbacker had heard the sharks consent death before it even arrives. He thought the fins around the rafts had already multiplied. The predators circled in the dark. Clouds raced across the sky in the moonlight. The familiar loneliness of the night set in. And this time, it was accompanied by fear. In the donut, Bartek began the long wait till morning with Alex's legs slowly stiffening in his lap. In Connecticut, Corinne Bond, known as Snooks, to her boyfriend, had, had already woken up to, mon- to a Monday morning. Before long, she'd be checking her mailbox to find yet another letter postmarked Hawaii and, sa- and signed by Alex K. Chapter 12. Daydreams On the morning of November 2nd, the 13th day at sea, they brought the rafts close again and, and dug in Alex's pockets for his wallet. They took his identification tag from around his neck. Sherry held on to both in the hope that he would be able to return them to Alex's family. Bartek asked if he could have Alex's leather jacket to keep him warm at night. Rigor mortis had set in, and Alex's limb were rigid. It took Bartek several minutes to wrestle the jacket free of the body. No one discussed the prospect of using the corpse for food. The others murmured what he remembered of the Catholic burial service. I can sign your body to the sea and your soul to the Lord, he said in conclusion. Then they rolled Alex's body over uh, over the side and into the ocean. He floated face down for some time before the men lost sight of him. With Alex gone, a new kind of gloom settled over the rafts. For two weeks, they'd imagined their own deaths. Now the prospect was real. Alex had been the weakest of the group from the start, but he could. But could the rest of them be far behind? Reynolds had probably lost a third of his body weight and looked more dead than alive. Bartek was a skeletal mass of salt ulcers and roasted skin. Rickenbacker seemed to be running on bile alone. Daniels was in better shape than everyone except Whitaker and Sherry, but he took Alex's death especially hard. He had only known the kid for two weeks, but he spent the better part of that time virtually sitting in his lap and watching while he wasted away. Now DeAngelis had lost face. Now DeAngelis lost faith, all faith in their chances, and and that made him a terrible raft mate for Rickenbacker. The two of them started arguing almost as soon as DeAngelis climbed in, and DeAngelis didn't have the patience for it. He soon asked to trade places with Reynolds. If it was all going to end soon, he wanted to be with his captain, Bill Sherry. Around the fourteenth day, another storm overtook them, and they collected water with practice skill. Rickenbacker transferred their horde into his mouth from bucket the vest, and he couldn't feel his rap and he could feel his raftmates watching to make sure he didn't swallow. Someone grumbled that the process was taking way too long. After the storm, the weather grew dead calm. When DeAndres joined Sherry and Whitaker, it put the three strongest men in one raft. That gave Sherry an idea. He and his raftmates, he announced, were going to cut loose from the others. The current at this point seemed to be pushing them steadily north. If, if, if the three of them put all their remaining strength into the oars, they might be able to get back on a southwest course, and that might be able to carry them away from the Japanese, towards the Ellis Islands, Fiji, and survival.
In any case, Sherry insisted, spreading out would give the give the search planes, assuming they were still up there, a better chance of finding them. Rickenbacker was furious. The best hopes lay in staying together. He was convinced of it. To be easier to sp- see from the sky. They needed one another for support. And besides, without Sherry and Whitaker, no one had the s- strength to pull a man back in the raft as someone went overboard. When Sherry refused to bend, Rickenbacker tried to pull rank. I forbid you to go, he said. Under what circumstances, Sherry said. I'm a colonel, Rickenbacker shot back. I'm ordering you not to go. Sherry and Whitaker reminded Rickenbacker that his rank made no difference, because he wasn't in the army. He was a f- civilian acting under orders from the Secretary of War. Abnison mustered enough strength to insist that being that he was an acting colonel, which put him in charge, he was ordering them not to go. I am in charge of the airplane, Sherry shot back. That means I'm in charge of this trip until we get back to land. The entire argument seemed ridiculous to DeAngelis. They weren't getting back to land. Not now, not tomorrow, nor not next week. Rick and Bucker and Admonson were fighting with their last ounces of strength to call themselves captains of a sinking ship. Rick and Bucker finally gave in and watched, and watched while Sherry, Whitaker, and DeAndres drifted into the distance. The three men pointed themselves towards the southwest and took turns with the oars. Two people were rowing while one rested. Several hours, they were still visible, maybe a mile away. Exhausted from the effort, the men fell f- sound asleep. When they awoke, they paddled slowly back and tied onto the other two rafts. The argument and the effort had all come to nothing. In the brutal calm, time sli- slipped past like the sea, with no milestone or benchmark. Th- there was only the restlessness cycle of the blinding sun and terrifying darkness. Scorching heat and bone-chilling cold. Simple tasks now required superhuman effort. Blowing up the sidewalls of the raft now took two of them more than two hours. Every now and then, they would try to paddle towards southwest. No one had the strength to keep at it. After a few minutes, they would collapse against the side, well, sides of the raft and give in to, to the still water. Occasionally, they stumbled onto a pot- paltry ration of food. At one point, two silvery fish jumped into one of the rafts to escape a shark, and then were on them in seconds. On another day, thousands of fingerlings drew venile fish the size of a finger, swept past the boat in the sheets. The water was so dense that the fi- with the fish that the men were able to grab a few with their bare hands. The unlucky fingerlings were swallowed whole while they were still alive. After the last storm, they had nearly a gallon of water stored in the life vests. It felt good to have a reserve, but they still doled it out in one or two ounce portions twice a day. The tiny amount barely freed the tongue from the roof of the mouth for a few minutes. It was nowhere near enough to starve off, to stave off the ravages of dehydration. Under normal conditions, the body, f- the bl- blood feeds the brain with oxygen it needs to function. Now, with such a paltry supply of water, the amount of blood in each man's body dwindled. Their veins shrank, and their their veins shrank, and their brains began to starve for oxygen. Dehydration sent the men into bouts of delirium. Day and night, they drifted in and out of a dream state, the line between sleep and wakefulness vanishing fast. Hallucinations crept into the hours when they were fully awake. One night, before I moved into Rickenbacker's boat, Reynolds sat up and whispered to Whitaker, Say, I guess you know about DeAndres and Sherry. They land on a secret island and get themselves a quart of water and, and, then, don't, and then come back and sit in the boat again. Shh, don't let the captain hear that. Rickenbucker woke up in a stupor and overheard Reynolds. Well, I'll be... Beep! Rickenbucker yelled, If anybody has an island, they better take me. Every night, Rickenbucker had his own island dreams. Usually they happened to land in a place where an old friend had a beautiful horse. The friend took him in, gave him a comfortable bed, and served him fruit juice. In the morning, all he'd have to wake up. All he'd have to do was wake up, reach for the phone, and call the Secretary of War Stimson, who would dispatch a plane to fly him home to Adelaide. I forget to say it. Instead, he woke up at three inches of salt water, wedged between two starving men, and floating in the middle of the Pacific. Bartek thought he was truly going crazy. The clouds transformed into people and animals hovering over the raft. A chicken, a giant bird, a woman with a dog in her lap. Under the menagerie, he drifted in and out of daydreams. In the strange space between asleep and awake, Bartek family visited him in the raft. His mother appeared and told him he would have to rely on God. 
His sister Ruth, who had died six weeks ago, told him she was okay and he would be too. And that is the end of chapter 11 and 12. So, I hope you guys did enjoy these two chapters. If you did, make sure to leave a big thumbs up, comment down below, hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you guys in the next video.